Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Brokelheimer. So on today's live stream, I welcome back Tim Herman. What's up there, Tim? Oh, uh, not a whole lot. Just <laughs> surviving. You? Sur oh, all's good over here, man. Yeah. So, um... Tim was on the stream, we were talking about this, Tim, about a year and a half ago, and he is a veteran SPS reef keeper since the late 1990s. He's been keeping SPS, and I, I, uh, I said this on the first time I had him on here in terms of kind of reading his bio, but his first SPS tank was an intensely illuminated 40-gallon breeder that was featured in Mike Pauletta's book, Ultimate Marine Aquariums, and was also the recentral tank of the month in October 2001. He has approximately 1,100 gallons of SPS-dominated reef tanks and a home business called Indoor Ecosystems that blends, this is very interesting, amphibian and coral propagation with amphibian conservation. Certainly, certainly a one-of-a-kind business, I would think. Just about. Um, if you've been on the livestock selling forums on, on forum on reef to reef, then you'll probably recognize his username, which is Thurman. And let me tell you, he has some really, really sweet SPS for sale. But before we start talking with Tim, I want to thank the sponsors of this live stream, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really, really appreciate them supporting the show. And I also appreciate all you folks out there that have been tuning in and are tuning in tonight. Please don't forget to hit that like button so more people can find the stream. And as always, encourage everybody to drop some questions in the chat, make some comments, what have you. We're going to have a very interactive discussion with Tim. So, Tim, man, how have you, uh, how you been? What's going on since we've uh, last uh, chatted? I guess some, some stuff's happening? or Oh, yeah. There's always something. Always happening. something, right? Two kids and a dog and life and you know it's just you know just keep it up. Some weeks you struggle. Some you sometimes you coast. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I remember what happened last week? Let alone what I'm supposed to do next week. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a couple of uh, fans uh, watching here. Um, Buffalo Sabers four two nine six. Tim is amazing. Love everything I get from him. Exclamation point. Um, Colin Gearing, good evening. Tim is a pro. Will be nice to hear from him. So, uh, yeah, folks, we'll uh, we'll we'll certainly dig in in terms of um, you know, with with uh, Tim in terms of how he um keeps the uh, reef tanks and all that stuff. But uh, I don't know, man. You want to give us a quick um summary, Tim, in terms of your your setup and what you like to use in terms of equipment. I mean, how many different tanks do you have in the eleven hundred gallons? Gallons. Uh, it's two different systems. One's 800-something and one's about 300-something. Uh, and they're both sort of, I've sort of arrived on a good dimension of a, a propagation tank. Um, it's about 30 inches wide, uh, 12 to 14 inches deep, and they're about 60 inches long. And so they're, they're sized, and so I can fit uh, reef breeders' fixtures over them. Those are mostly what I use for propagation. I still have some do-it-yourself Cree LED fixtures I built around 2008, 2010 that are still running. Wow. It was funny. I sold some Colorado Sunburst anemones to a guy, and uh, he's like, so where are these grown under? I'm like, well, they're actually growing under a 14-year-old light that's still been running nonstop. <laughs> so, yeah. It was one of the early uh, adopters of LEDs. So, yeah, everything's LED. So, the, uh, in terms of the LEDs, the uh, those those 14-year-old fixtures, now, what I've heard is that leds will uh, eventually lose their uh, intensity and will have to be replaced isn't that not the case with all leds they do lose it to some degree um most of those tanks are lower light that i still have those really old ones running over a lower light but i do have one of them that's from 2010 running that uh yeah when i measure the par under it, it seems decent uh part of it i don't run them at maximum i kind of overbuilt them in terms of the number of leds back then uh, so I can I can run them at you know they started running around sixty percent or seventy percent. Gotcha. As long as you're not overdriving the LEDs, then the the life is extended, and you always have a little buffer. You can turn them up. And I've probably done that over the years. You know, every few years, I just think hey, I should check on what the par is. And yeah, once I finally got a par meter and see how things are doing, but yeah, still grows 
four under the thing after that long. So I got another, uh, for people who have seen my, my system thread on reef to reef, I had a gorgeous blue squamosa that got up to about two feet long. Yeah, that was times. cool. And that one died back in like 2018 or so, 2017, 2018. Finally got another little replacement. It's kind of a multicolored one. It's got a bit of a beige background with blue polka dots and stuff. And that's it's already up to yeah, four or five inches. That's a blue squammy? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a multicolored squammy. It's got blue spots and uh, kind of like a aqua rim around it and then kind of a Dude, uh, I haven't uh, I haven't tried clams like in years because um, you know, years ago I used to keep clams without an issue. Uh, you know, I'm talking like, you know, ten years ago or whatnot. But, um, I don't know, maybe like five years ago, six years ago, I, I started to, again to try to keep clams and I just could not keep a, uh, you know, a clam alive. Is, uh, is yeah. that something that you noticed in terms of, um, did you have to kind of go through a few clams to get, uh, a good one or no, has that not been an issue? Right off the bat, I had no problems. And this one actually looked about the same when it was small. When I got the blue one the first time, it was actually gold with blue polka dots. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Uh really cool color i'll get that and then as it aged the gold disappeared and it became mostly just like swirly blue um but that one yeah i just had that one and it did fine but yeah over the years i've noticed especially when i tried to replace the blue one i went through three or four before i finally got one that really took and has been thriving for me what was your um, um where would you pick it up from what was your source the the one that is surviving was an ora one from divers den i believe um, gotcha called now live aquarium not dfs anymore yeah i don't think um i'm not i haven't been like keeping up with the uh with live aquarium the divers den and all that stuff but uh, i haven't seen any i guess i haven't really been shopping for clams and whatnot yeah i mean they, they come in in batches or a i think has a fairly steady supply of clams still they had some gigas on there a while back that were really have a big tank and want to yeah in right that that'll like no, take up a lot of real estate my friend from uh from coral view he likes the guy because he had one back in the day that got huge. And I think he donated it out to shed or somewhere probably. Yeah. So, uh, all right. I, uh, I interrupted you in terms of the, uh, the lighting you were, uh, kind of. So, yeah. So yeah, lots of reef breeders fixtures. Um, Adam from battle corals is a good friend. He got me started on those. He kind of converted me from the DIY ones that when they finally enough of these, uh, commercial fixtures came out and had some, had good track records. He, he uh, convinced me to try those out, and they became much cheaper and uh, easier than building my own. Uh, I, I would always go crazy with stuff, and dump a lot of money in massive heat sinks. And, yeah. So, so yeah, LED lit. Uh, I've switched most things over to Reef Octopus external skimmers. They seem a lot more reliable, better at pulling out gunk, um, better at buffering the pH because you can really crank a lot of air through there in the winter time. I struggle with low pH, like probably a lot of people do. What's your uh, uh, what's your pH range? Right now, if, if you believe what the probe is saying, which I tried to recalibrate uh, not that long ago, the main system's around about six point nine, six point nine five, or seven point nine. Sorry, seven point nine five. Yeah, that's still kind of low. Yeah, it's still still pretty low. I thought it was doing great, and then I recalibrated this winter. And I was like, oh. It's low. <laughs> How often do you recalibrate your uh, probes? I would say every one to 16 months or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I'm like, uh, I'm a little more anal on that regard. I do it like every six weeks, eight weeks. It's hard to keep a tight schedule on a lot of different maintenance things. So. Yeah. You know, that's the whole thing about keeping reef tanks and stuff like, man, it, um, there's a lot of things on that to-do list. And sometimes those things, uh, are kind of hard to uh, take care of if you got, you know, other things going on in life. Yes, I'm at a busy stage of life. Um, you just have to enjoy it if, if you can slow down your mind enough to think about enjoying it. Um, um, all right, so you got the yeah. external uh, skimmer. So no, uh, no, skimmer. no internal skimmer. You got external. You're running external skimmers, huh? Just tried external skimmers on both. I tried. I've had a variety of internal ones over the years, and they always would have flooding issues, and uh, yeah, there'd always be something. Something would pop up that would cause a flood. Like you have this much water, and you have I've got leak alarms and everything, and there's always some way to put water on the floor that you there haven't is. thought of. Even twenty years, you find a new way for something. <laughs> to flood. Um, yeah, overflowing the waste bucket, or so now I have leaks 
sensors in the bucket on the rims. And so if they get high, that sets off an alarm. I, uh, I wired an alarm all the way to the bedroom. So that uh, Apex kicks out a little siren for me. If, uh, I've uh, if I've turned I, off like all audible alarms. I, I run the uh, the GHL Proflux and, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just... Um, I've got two different systems too, and I, I just decided to turn off the audible alarms, and I'm just leaving on my, um, you know, my text alerts and my email uh, alerts because it's so it's like one thing after another, you know, in terms of like you know when you're doing maintenance, you'll kick off an alarm or something if something gets out of whack, and um, I don't know, I just uh, it 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 kind of makes me panic a little bit more when I hear the audible alarm versus actually getting a text or an email. That's just me. Yeah. I've got all those texts and emails, but at night I have that turned off just so I can sleep and not get. So you get you get an audible alarm, man. You're getting out of bed. You're taking care of business, huh? Yeah. So I actually have a little hardwired alarm. I found. Uh, yeah, there was some wiring from a security system in our house that snaked all the way up to a control panel in the bedroom that wasn't being used. I'm like, I think I can use these. And so <laughs> <laughs> just turned it in front of a twelve volt power supply and the. Uh, the apex kicks on that outlet when the leak alarm goes off. So that's the only one that will get me out of bed. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, four, it's always four in the morning, no matter how late I stay up, the leaks happen at four in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, when I, yeah, when I, whenever I do see that alarm in terms of the leak sensor being uh, triggered, that definitely kind of rocks my world a little bit, especially when I'm not home. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, luckily, I haven't had that happen when I'm not home. Uh, I'm home a lot, so, yeah. It's... All right, so um, that's interesting, an external skimmer. Usually, you know, I mean, years ago, I, I had um, an external skimmer to my sump, and, um, you know, I, I, I've always been using the internal skimmers uh, these days, and it seems like that's that's kind of a, an exception in terms of going external versus internal. Was that uh, Was there a reason behind going external versus internal? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was able to oversize it without trying to sacrifice the space from the sump. Um, and I went from, I've spent many years being a, oh, skimming's not that important, it's just a fancy aerator thing, to finally I realized, like, it can really help do pH if you're pulling an outside air in the winter months. And uh, less for the waste removal, because I kind of, everything is kind of is in a cycle after my systems are sold. So the waste don't really build up but yeah keeping it aerated and the stability of the water level in the skimmer is great because yes internal ones are always you don't have to worry about it you don't have to worry about it like i had a, a dell tech internal that would something you got this little dial thing that you got a funny shaped piece of plastic going up and down yeah. i couldn't figure out why but it would get stuff clogged along the edges of it as soon as you uh, impact the flow around the edges of that plastic disc you're suddenly like your your water level is right. all out of whack. Yeah, I, I was I was running a Dell Tech skimmer too. You know, I um so I have two Dreambox, you know, real exclusive Dreambox um, sumps. And the cool thing is with this um, with the Dreambox is they and a lot of, I guess a lot of sumps have this, but there's like a baffle that I can raise mm -hmm. and lower. So I in the skimmer compartment I've um, uh, lowered the baffle enough to where or raise it uh, whatever it is where the water level is different in the skimmer compartment it's higher in the skimmer compartment versus the last compartment with the return pumps which means that that skimmer is always going to be running um super consistent because the water level never changes in that skimmer um, compartment so that's that's how i kind of um am able to get yeah. around that and i would never seem to have issues with that because my water levels are always stable in my sumps with the top off system i use but the uh yeah, for some reason, I would find ways. Something would set off the skimmer, and it would just overproduce and then flood the bucket. And, and Yeah, I, I could never entirely figure out why, but I was very prone to flooding things with those skimmers. So um, let's let's go jump back quickly to lighting because uh, John Graves is asking you a question. Tim, any thoughts of implementing metal halides again? Are you done? Done. Done? Uh, heat? Is there a few heat back in the day. I feel like Millipore maybe did better under halides. Uh, but yeah, I, I run so many tanks, the price of my electric bill, just, I couldn't even wrap my head around what it would be if I was running halo. Is, um, and the heat, I mean, there's so many other confounding factors. I don't have that much hair, so I would burn my forehead on them. When I was me too. Yeah. Um, but I do run halides on one of my systems, but, um, and you know, I, heat is definitely a, uh, a, a concern, you know, on, on my system that I'm running halides, I do have a chiller. 
that um, that will kick on every now mm -hmm. and then in the summertime. I also have like some industrial um, commercial grade fans that I have running on top of my frag tanks that are plumbed into that system. So, mm -hmm. and then my other system that I have, and I don't think um, I had this tank up and running when I had you on last. This is a, um, I, I got a Peninsula tank running now. It's a 225 gallon Peninsula tank and I've got the GHL, you know, Mitras, the LEDs on that tank. So that definitely runs um, cooler for me. Um, but yeah, I, I could definitely see, you know, the heat being an issue for folks. Do you have, you have all your systems in, in your basement, right? Yeah, they're in the basement and I live in a pretty northern latitude. So luckily, even in the summer months, I don't really have heat issues with this setup. Um, I do I keep the air conditioning running pretty much all summer just to keep it uh, from becoming an issue. Uh, and then I've got an HRV that runs a lot. I, if for people who don't know, HRV is a heat recovery ventilator. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, it's a basically a fancy fan box, uh, that I installed again with Adam's suggestion. He discovered before I did. He, con and, uh, he, yeah. he convinced me to do that too. Yeah. They're amazing. And as long as they don't, one of the fans doesn't fail in the middle of winter, which has happened twice to me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That happened again this year. Um, in January, so that threw everything off again. It was it was all the same week. I think it's the bad water change. And, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. He um he turned me on to the uh, to the heat ex air exchange. You know, whatever you call these things, he uh, yeah. he turned me on to that thing, and um, it it raised my pH by like point two pH points. You know, in, awesome. in one of my systems, which was like huge. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I mean, in the um. So I have my, my, all my uh, tanks in the basement here too, the finished basement. And in the summertime, I'll crank the windows open. It's not a lot. Uh, I don't have a lot of windows in the basement here, but at least I get the, uh, the fresh air going. But I also, last, um, when I added the second system last summer, I did have to add a window AC unit down in the basement because um, I guess to have having the, uh, the extra system and the extra sump in the sump room kind of like added some additional heat for the whole... Um, downstairs yeah. and so i had to get the um i had to get an ac unit going which i don't run you know all the time i run it when because here in vermont it's um pretty cool yeah. in the summer times but every now and then like a week here a week there it can get pretty hot but uh, i guess what i uh if i go on vacation i'm gonna have to crank that thing on all the time even if it's not that uh hot out because you know who's ever house sitting i can't uh, ask them to be turning the ac unit on and off but, yeah, uh, the, uh, the pH thing is great, great too. But the thing I, I had noticed that I get variations in pH with outside temperature even more than ventilation. Because with the HRV, it's all pretty consistent air exchange. But if we jump like this week, two days ago we were at 19 degrees in the morning, and then yesterday we we're at 73. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it's a massive temperature swing. And like I, it changes my consumption of alkalinity, everything. And it's weird because nothing's really photosynthesizing right now. So there's not a big change in like carbon dioxide outside, I wouldn't think. But for some reason, it, it impacts the tank directly. Do you, um, and, do you uh, notice any difference in terms of the way the corals are behaving or is it um, not a big? Not entirely. I mean, just using alkalinity as an indicator, I usually see a big drop, especially like this is going to be doing this. And so I have to either try and just let it ride or try to compensate with uh, interesting yeah because I've, I've gotten some swings myself lately too and um yeah we've had some definite swings in temperatures so uh frank aaron is wondering tim uh, is tim in on the caulk game caulk wasser uh yeah so now that was a couple of years ago i really started trying to address the low winter ph thing and so both of my systems i've got those vast uh calc reactors with the, that my auto top off feeds through so it tops off with the calc um, and they stir all the time until they seize up. Like if your cow turns to a brick at the bottom, locks it down. <laughs> and then you notice, oh, suddenly your alkalinity is doing something else weird. But yeah, it's all it's all about alkalinity in this game, I think. And uh, once you master that, if you can ever master it, then you're, you're what, um, what 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 uh, what what range do you like to keep your uh, alkalinity at? Uh, nine point two is what I kind of aim for in the main system. I can keep it right in there. That seems to be a good balance for. Or what what I run what I, I, uh, people are what, go ahead I was just gonna say somebody I had posted on reef to reef about uh, for what people wanted to hear about and they're asking about my ideal parameters and so I've got 
I probably mentioned this in the last uh, interview, but yeah, I've got this kind of an odd situation in my main system where I have fairly high phosphates and never detectable nitrates. Um, yet everything's really happy. And I can only attribute that to it being a really old system that's been running since 2006. And there's a lot of bacterial diversity and stuff going on in there. And uh, I think all the corals, there's so much coral in there, it's sucking up the nitrogenous ammonia uh, before it has a chance to be converted into uh, nitrates. So um, they're still getting their nitrogen, clearly, because I've got like six auto feeders on that, dropping pellets and, and flakes in every day and still free and frozen uh, one tank. So there is nitrogen cycling through it. Um, but So anyway, that when I try to aim for my phosphates around 0.1... 0.11, 0.12 is my happy spot for that. Um, calcium, I don't really even pay attention to. It just goes with the, the alkalinity, but yeah, right. it's usually four. And you're using four. a uh, you, calcium reactor? <clears throat> calcium reactor, yeah, a big calcium reactor. And uh, that's another one of those wild card variables with the loss of normal, uh, what do you call it, the TLF reborn media when it changed over. To that small stuff, uh, there was yeah, there was a period there where I was really on edge about it. I think it seems okay. Um, yeah, I'm using that now too. I um I had been using the uh, the Carib C, uh, large arm media um, years and years ago, and I've talked about this before on the uh, on the stream. But they they changed up their formula, you know. So I um I hadn't been using it for a long time, and then I got back into calcium reactors. I had been using two part. So I, um, I, I started using the, uh, I bought a whole ton of like the large arm. And I, what I found out is that the melting, the pH melting point is a lot lower than it used to be. Yes. Which sucks. I did the same thing when the, when the large arm first, or the large uh, reborn disappeared or we knew it was going. And I saw like one box left and uh, was topping off my reactor. And I started recycling a lot of aquaport because I was growing way too much. So I just pull them out cut off big branches and dry them out and then throw them in the reactor. Um, but yeah, I, I looked at every media I could find and wanted to see like how they would compare to the reborn. And I bought the Seachem one. I bought the Brightwell one. I think I bought the arm and I put them in, I weighed how much it was and I put them in a little grid and it was an old uh, Eheim tray from like one of those round filters that, you know, so water could flow through it. And I put it in the reactor and left it running just as at the same pH that my reborn was normally running at. And I waited all after like a month and like none of this just <laughs> I realized this was not going to be a one for one alternative Bummer. Uh, replacement reborn. So yeah, luckily the, the other reborn came out, the little stuff and I was scouring the internet and buying it up, you know, small bags and whatever I could for a while. And then, uh, then they released it and I bought a load of cases of that and then it turned out being really small not not large in spite of the name but uh it still seems to work more or less this, uh, um so problem prone is asking roughly how many mls a day of the caulk uh, are you dosing tim i mean so are you ba pretty pretty much dosing when you're yeah. evaporating it's dosing when i'm evaporating one to one so it's at least five gallons uh in the main system i think i, I measured it out i think it's like Maybe more than that. Might have been like eight or nine gallons on the on the main system, and then uh, yeah. What, what I'm doing is um, I'm not using. I'm, I'm doing the uh, the Chris Meckley uh, ACI Aquaculture um, Caulk Walser method. So what I have is um, I've got a 30 gallon drum, you know, with RODI water in it, and mm -hmm. what I do is I I put in enough um, caulk Walser to uh, super saturate the solution. So I don't have a stirrer in there. I don't um, have a pump in there to, um, you know, um, disturb the, uh, the the sediment. Pretty much what I'm what I do is I have a um, my my GHL dosers feeding both of my tanks from that 30 gallon vat, and um, I think I'm dosing on one system like um, I want to say about 8,000 mLs. A uh, a day, and the other um, maybe a little bit less, maybe sixty five hundred mLs uh, a day. But I'm you know doing the same kind of thing, trying to like replace what I'm evaporating on um, on the uh, with the caulk washer. So uh, yeah, and it, it and it's been working uh, great. And so when when I go through the thirty gallon drum, I basically just put you know the um, I measure out what I need in terms of the caulk washer powder, put it in the bottom of the drum, and I 
turn on the rod the pump i've got from the uh, rodi reservoir and pumps the rodi water into it mixes it up settles down and then it just um does that dosing but it's the same kind of um principle in terms yeah. of what you're doing yeah i looked at that and i my ro reservoir it's basically on an auto top off from the ro uh but it only kicks on for a certain number of hours at night so i'm not short cycling the, the membrane and uh, that's about 30 gallons but i never really even get more than a quarter of an evaporation every day um and then that feeds in with uh those aquatech type pumps the diaphragm pumps that feed my auto top off on float switches and that pumps through the the vast calc reactor but i did notice i tried something kind of like that with a, a bucket of a whole bunch of calc in the bottom of a five gallon bucket without a stirring mechanism in it and the, and then I bought Navaster, and it was just night and day difference. It was not even close to the amount of water that I was putting through it. So, um, yeah, the, the Navasters are much much more reliable. So, all right, you've got the air exchange unit. You're, you're dosing a <laughs> caulk washer through your RODI, yet you're still kind of on the low side on um, on pH. What uh, what do you attribute that to at this point? No idea. Faulty it's faulty pro maybe. It, no, I, I've, I've swapped it out. I tried. I went through all that stuff. I mean, so it could be the amount of gas exchange. Like, I just have one skimmer on uh, what works out to like seven tanks or something like that. So, and it doesn't have a real high flow rate through it, uh, through those circulation loops. It's only on two main loops that feed all those seven roughly tanks back to the sump. And then the skimmer pulls off the sump. So, um, yeah, it could just be that. You know, the skimmer doesn't pull out a lot of CO2. There was a period when I, I was panicked about it, and I was throwing, like, smaller internal skimmers into prop tanks to see if that could buffer it, like, partway down the circulation loop. And it helped some, but wasn't enough that I really needed it. And I don't know what's going on with, like, in rock that's that old. It's uh, so very old. <laughs> There's hundreds of pounds of... Uh, yeah. Oh, we got Chris Meckley from ACA Aquaculture is watching. He said, "Did someone say cockwasser?" There he goes. That's the uh, <laughs> that, that's the uh, that's the man in terms of cockwasser. Um, so, have have you tried anything else like a CO two scrubber or anything on your system? <laughs> scrubber, it was it would burn out. I mean, I'd exhaust it in a couple of days um, because so much, yeah, so much use of everything going through that much water. So. It was kind of expensive and a pain in the butt. And honestly, like I hadn't seen any major issues. I would see some certain corals would have certain acros would have issues in the winter time, but all all in all, can't can't grow everything perfectly. All right. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, for sure, you can't keep everything happy all at the same time. That's right. Yeah, there's always uh, there's always an outlier. So, uh, all right, we, we talked about uh, your skimmer. We've talked about lighting. We've talked about uh, the calcium alkalinity supplementation. Talk to us about um, nutrient control. You mentioned in terms of the corals probably doing some heavy lifting in terms of exporting, you know, some of the nitrates and phosphates. But what else are you doing besides skimming to uh, control nutrients? Uh, I do have a refugium on both systems that are kind of jam-packed at the moment, I think, with Calerpa. There's kind of a, a battle royale eternal between uh, keto and calerpa in there. Um, the calerpa lentilifera, I think, the one looks like a string of grapes. Um, and they uh, they probably do pull out some uh, some of that, but I don't really harvest it all that much until it gets way up at the top, and I'll cut out like a third. Um, it just ends up like a solid. It's not huge. On a 800-gallon system, it's like a 30-gallon tank, so it's probably not doing a ton. I do notice downstream of that, and that's more, I think, for pumping out microfauna to feed the corals than it is for uh, uh, removing nutrients, I'd say. That's my philosophy on the refugiums. I do have one tank that dumps into where I have things like uh, that I kind of my corals I pay the most attention to that I'm most worried about um, and kind of hyper-focused on things that I either really like or really rare or expensive or whatever. And uh, everything that I put in there seems to do really well. Um, it catches probably the most food out of the refugium. And so that tank is kind of the, the chosen one in terms of growth and everything else. Yeah, there you go. You always have to have that, that one system that, uh, you know, you yeah. want to just pay a little extra attention to. Like a little tiny, one of my many prop tanks. It just happened to be the lucky one that's right below the refugium. So, so yeah, I mean, 
I used to keep a, um, a refugium and I also had uh, an algae reactor on one of my systems, but actually I got rid of those because, um, I started dosing bacteria on a regular basis mm -hmm. and, and I'm, you know, I, I've been dosing the, uh, Brightwell's Microbacter 7, the NB7, as well as a Microbacter, uh, clean. So it's, um, yeah, it's been interesting. You know, I've been doing that for, for almost a year now and, you know, I, I don't know about you in terms of uh, maintenance on the refugium, but it is it can be sort of a pain in the ass in terms of um, I mean I, I used to keep Cato, so maybe Cato's uh, a little tougher to to uh, to maintain than the uh... it's a crash on me sporadically. And yeah, I, best I figure is it's related to potassium, possibly iodine. Those are the two things now that I've sort of arrived at is that they can drop out of whatever happy zone and you can start to see issues because i mean my alkalinity i monitor constantly um but potassium is one i start to see losing color in red tables um and red corals especially uh across the board a few things just brown out um the uh strawberry shortcake types those aussie green and pink things if you're potassium seems like they crash on me when my potassium gets out. How often are you measuring uh, potassium? When I'm seeing issues, uh, I was checking it probably twice a week and trying mm -hmm. to dose it up. And then, of course, I had a bad potassium kit for one of those sessions. And <laughs> what uh, what, what brand kit are you using? I always, I always find things like ways to layer problems <laughs> on each other. What what, uh, what what kit were you using? Are you using? Um, I believe it was the Salifer one. And it was... It was just an older kit, and uh, yeah, it was reading way off. And then I tested it with a new kit, and it's like, whoa, that's not right. Well, no, actually, first I ran a, uh, uh, what do you call it, the ICP test, the Triton test, and uh, it came out like really high. I was like, well, that's crazy. And then I tested with another kit. I was like, oh, that's a bad kit. I've overdosed it now, and that sent things off. You know? And I talk about like these major issues. I'm really like, it's mostly just like certain corals. I've got like 200 probably aquapora. So 90% of them all the time are fine and just keep growing. And I'm like I'll virtually throwing them away sometimes and turn it back into reactor media. But there's always the few that you just keep your eye on. You're like, those are my canaries that, yeah, you yeah. Know, that, that year, then something is off. Like that thing just grew for the past three years into a huge colony and suddenly it's turning brown. There's some something's wrong that's so, that's the whole yeah. thing man it's like you know like you said you got 200 colonies and you got like maybe 10 percent of them that um are not looking optimal and it bot you yeah. know it, it's it's something that's it's it bothers you right if you're not batting 100 percent, i mean look at the uh the major leaguers if they're batting 300 that's awesome right i mean they should be happy about that but you know as reef keepers it's a whole different ball game because uh yeah you got like one or two of your prize colonies that are starting yeah. to like you know start to uh bleep the bed then uh you're um you know it just changes your whole psyche yeah if you want a demonstration of how humbled i can be today my purple monster colony died after like four no years. way the tyree purple monster it didn't have a backup frag i was not going to touch it for and it went from like a half inch piece from cops all the way up to oh, i was probably four inches across at least it was just getting to the point it was about the well, christmas tree out I, it i probably the biggest one i ever got out of that coral that coral's always i um and yeah I, I, today i looked at it i was like what the heck it looks gray and it's slimy and i pick it up and it's dead on the bottom and uh dude i mean uh well you should we should definitely be in touch i mean i got two i got I got. I think the original piece I got was from cops so I'm growing one out really? I've got um, I got two pieces growing out I got a uh, you know nothing big nothing big to frag at, at this point in time but I got yeah. one going in my 187 gallon system and I got another one going in the new uh, peninsula tank but uh, hopefully it starts uh, growing faster because that's that's a uh, that's a real old wow. school beautiful coral that you just do not see around for sale these days yeah we were talking uh before the stream started that about my water change issue. So I, somebody had asked also about what my thoughts were on salt. And after many years, since like the early 2000s, I've been using reef crystals. And just about two months ago, I switched to Red Sea. Because I, I, especially since that Central Garden and Pet took over uh, reef crystals and instant ocean, 
especially the reef crystals I noticed they're like the bags would show up and they turn yellow within a couple of months if I didn't use them the plastic would turn yellow and it turned into a brick and they changed the type of bags they were using on the, the cases so I switched to the buckets and then I did a water change one time in the past two years and I noticed my alkalinity just dropped like a rock and I tested the leftover salt water from the fresh freshly mixed stuff and it was a alkalinity of five a cage of five Ooh, like, ouch this is like that's you know luckily that was a drop it was less bad than the last one i did and it was a i think i had, I had a couple issues again layered on top of each other in january I had some pumps i accidentally turned off and kind of got a little anoxic layer in a couple tanks and i had to water change out and siphon out a bunch of stuff and do a water change and I already set it up for water change for the main system. So I pulled some of that water off and changed it out. And then I did my other change in the main system. And within a day, corals were turning gray and dying, like right where the water pumped into that system. Yeah. systems, like the exact same actual coral, because I had backups of either one. And it was my blue monsters, the Pang's blue monster and the reef gen blueberry fantasy, which are some of my absolute favorite all time corals. And they just turned gray and lost all color. Had a granulosa turn from bright green to pure gray. Lost all color. Wow. Within two days of those water changes. I'm like, there is something wrong. So I had some of that water. I sent it off for ICP. Didn't get a whole lot. There were a few things off on it. And then I tested the alkalinity and it had been sitting in a bucket for a while, but it came up at like over 11. And I knew, like, I, I just nuked it. And after that, when you can have five or 11 out of the same salinity, yeah. I, I I did, I'm done with it, and uh, I switched to Red Sea. And so far, so good. The things have been happy, and it's been, of course, two months for those colonies to slowly get back into gear. And that's one thing I, I kind of think could have been the issue with the Purple Monster is that it was in a different tank, but on the same system, and all of that type, which it seems to be a, a similar one to those Blue Monsters, which were sensitive to that issue. It didn't seem to be off, but it could have just been a delayed effect of uh, that one bad water change in January. Yeah, what a, what a <laughs> what a bummer, man. I mean, I guess I guess there's been a lot of uh, you know uh, talk about the Tropic Marin pro uh, yeah. salt in terms of people having issues. Have, have other people had similar uh, issues with the reef crystals, or are you uh, like an outlier? Was I think everybody I was one of the one of the people that hadn't you've been converted to some other i was just like it's always worked for me why should i switch but then if the quality control has switched since their their corporate changes i think that was enough to push me out and the red sea stuff they've got like an icp traceable thing on every batch in the lid and uh, it's an actual seawater too from what i understand it's probably just a byproduct of uh desalinization plants in israel and they they use actual red sea salt they're shipping you so how uh hopefully less uh chance for weird you know fluctuation what are you uh so what are you testing in terms of when you mix up a salt you know a batch of new salt what are you uh, actually testing in that uh new salt water mix yeah lately i'm testing alkalinity every time and uh and salinity of course and getting the temperature right but uh usually not a lot beyond that i mean there's i thought about running an icp on every water change because it's like usually that'll get expensive it could get expensive and the other thing is I started during this last session, like I tried the ATI ICPs, I tried the ICPanalysis.com, and I tried Triton. And I was like, well, some of these should line up. First, I did this, the ICP analysis and the Triton one, and I sent them both in, literally in the same scoop of water, like in the tank, dunked the tubes together, sent them off, and you get wildly different results in some of the some of the elements. And it's like, why am I even paying for this if yeah. it's consistent that, like, between the different providers and stuff. And I'd seen threads about this, of course. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a real thing. And so now I'm like, well, I'll just test what I can. And I think I'll probably do Triton if I do test it. That's only a, sometimes you catch something wildly out of whack. What? I did see that, that my, like, high lithium is one thing that always showed up in my system on those. And it was when I test fresh reef crystals that was pretty much the source of the high lithium it was coming straight up yeah i um i used to use esv salt which is a great great salt and um it always used to test out you know my my systems always used to have um, when i did icp test very very high lithium but from what i understand high lithium is not um something to be too concerned about right i don't know now 
alkalinity of 11 dumping industry. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's. But yeah. It's 100 gallons, too. I mean, that's, you know, that's not an insignificant amount of money for that much salt. And uh, uh, it's just kind of a weight. Like, suddenly they have a batch that's 11. What do you do with it? You know? Yeah, you know, so it's it's tough, man. I mean, it's it's uh, you know what. So what do you believe in terms of the uh, you know what ICP is the uh, is the best uh, way to go? You know, in terms of uh, so in, in in terms of like testing alkalinity, you have an alkalinity monitor. Uh, I do have the Alcatronic, which I really like. That thing's been a workhorse. I had a maybe it was a Cage Guardian or something like that. First, it was not for. Uh, serving my purpose as well i had a lot of issues with that it was early on when they were first releasing that stuff um and i switched to alcatronic and it's been through its growing pains of course and i've had a few issues here and there but coral view and carlos have always been great at helping me address them and the guy I forget his name right now who actually designed the thing he's uh, real responsive yep helps you troubleshoot it yep <clears throat> um and, and so for for potassium, what are you using to dose potassium when you have um, certain sh uh, you know shortfalls? Uh, I think it was just potassium chloride I was using. It was just bulk stuff, and then uh, I didn't have that. And I ordered some, I'm not sure if it's Brightwell or uh, Seachem potassium. My Brightwell. Yeah, you, that's basically you know who uh, a brand. You know, who turned me on to uh, potassium chloride actually as a uh, as a dip was uh, Ty Ta. Farmer tie, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I mean, maybe we could transition into a discussion in terms of um, quarantining and pests and all that stuff because I made the switch from using the Bayer Advanced, uh, you know, insecticide as dip for aquarium flatworms to this uh, potassium chloride. Man, and it's like been a revelation. You know, a mm -hmm. it's like you know, knock on wood, I haven't lost any frags that I've been dipping in this stuff. But yeah. b it's like it's clear. So if you do have any aquaweeding <laughs> flatworms, you kind of see them flying right off, and it actually uh, disintegrate. They they'll disintegrate because yeah. of the uh, the osmotic uh, shock on them. But what what's your um, mm. you know quarantine procedure? I, I, so are you bringing in any um, wild corals, any mariculture, or are you pretty much just doing? Uh, I have a very very uh, limited number of people I actually acquire corals from, and if I go outside that, I'm like paranoid about them and I dip the heck out of them and run interceptor on my quarantine and stuff just to uh, uh, make sure they're clean before it ever ends up in my system. I've had enough times over the years when it's just like, oh, something got in. It, usually it was just red bugs or something that was treatable, but uh, treating this much uh, much of a system is such a pain in the butt that you, you know, it's not, uh, not worth it to let anything in. So I'm of the throw it in the trash before you introduce something mindset rather than, you know, risk it for a single new frag kind of a deal. So what do you, uh, what, what is your procedure when you're even bringing in stuff from trusted sources? <laughs> yeah, I'll pretty hard and, and bare usually, and then, uh, put them into quarantine. Uh, if it's, and, and then wash them. I mean, I, I check them pretty thoroughly. I know what to look for now. There's a handful of things. Um, they tend to fly under the radar. Some of those gray bugs on tenuous and some of the torts and granulosa and stuff have parasites that seem to be specific to those varieties. They're a lot harder to, to spot than like a red bug or a flatworm. Um, so those I watch for, and then I, I dip them on the way out as well and bear. If the, and then I run interceptor, of course, if I see anything. If it's a tenuous, I run interceptor because it seems like loads of those have. Uh, so have those on your uh, on your corn on your quarantine system, you're just blasting it with interceptor every now and then. It's yeah, I do it, um, and it's like I'm trying to remember if it's twelve or twenty times the dose that's normal on a uh, for treating your system. It was like one large breed pill for four hundred gallons, and I do it's on a thirty gallon tank, and I do like roughly ten, twelve times that I think, uh, and I'll run that for six, eight hours, and then well, it's a thirty gallon tank, so I just do a complete water change and. Uh, and take that out and then I'll repeat that after seven days and then after 14 days and do three rounds of that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I, um, I have a 20 gallon quarantine tank. And, um, so what I do is I'll, um, I'll bring in, you know, frags and, um, I'll do anywhere from like a four to six week quarantine and, uh, I'll, I'll dip once a week, you know, throughout that period. 
for um, using the uh, potassium chloride. And then at the end of that, I'll, um, and Ty turned me on to this. It's called uh, Dr. G's. And, and mm -hmm. it's a, um, it's like a, the same Milton mycine oxime or whatever it is. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's the same kind of uh, active ingredient, I guess that interceptor has. So I'll, um, I'll do that. That That's like a dip that I'll do outside of the tank for like six hours. Okay. But it actually um, seems to be pretty harsh, you know, to um, to the uh, to the corals, and and um, I've had some that uh, have gotten pretty pissed off. So I'm I'm kind of like looking to tweak that part of my routine. Yeah. But maybe I should do what you're talking about, which is just kind of hit the 20 gallon tank with the uh, with the 10 to 12 times the amount of uh, recommended interceptor, and then I, I normally do like 50 percent water changes anyway every week on that quarantine right. tank. But yeah, it's a, pretty easily just to swap out all the water on that thing right mine i actually just do a water change from the main system so they're constantly being acclimated i just have a yep. maxi jet that pumps in water so i drain water out the bottom with the bulkhead into a bucket pull out you know five ten gallons and then just pump that much in and add fresh water to my main system to top it off so. yeah that's that's what i've been doing like when i do water changes on my uh one of my my uh, established systems i pretty much will drain out like 10 gallons from the 20 gallon quarantine tank and then put 10 gallons back in from the established system. Yep. Pretty freaking easy, right? I yep. mean, it takes like, it takes me like five yeah, minutes. Five. Exactly. What, do you, uh, yep. what else do you have uh, on your, uh, I mean, all I've got on my quarantine system, I've got, obviously I've got some lighting. I've got some LED lights on it. I've got a uh, hang on the back filter. I've got a, um, I've got a heater and I've got a uh, gyro pump and that's about it. I'm not dosing. I, and I got a, you know, I got a, um, RODI and I'm topping off with RODI, like a little liter meter type of thing, but I'm not doing anything else to that, um, that 20 gallon tank. Are you doing anything else for your 30? I have a, a probably could be a 30 year old protein skimmer now. It's called a Sanders Piccolo. It's a little like clear tube with the uh, limewood air stone yes. in it. That's my skimmer on it. And, uh, I have that with, uh, yeah, a little MP30, I think. Uh, stuck on the side and I hang on the back filter that's got mostly rock rubble in it. And uh, yep. that's about it. I don't even have a heater. And, and I got a little refrigerator fixture, a mini one that I had sitting around. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's been pretty effective. I mean, do you notice like the frags? I mean, how long do you keep your frags in that uh, quarantine system? Uh, I usually err on the side of caution. So it's usually ends up being at least a month. Uh, usually could be longer than that. Right now I've got some that are, yeah, they're going a month and a half, two months. I should probably dip again and pull out because they're doing great. But, Do you notice any yeah. uh, degradation in terms of color or um, polyp extension on one that? The weirdest thing is, so like that Ice Fire Echinata, that old school Tyree piece. You have that yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to grow it like crazy back when I had that big clam and then for some reason I can't grow it anymore. I've tried multiple times and killed chunks of it. I've got a friend in town that has it and he gives me frags occasionally. I try them again. They thrive in my... Uh, quarantine tank by themselves but as soon as you start adding other corals into it and i think it might be a bacterial thing like it just doesn't do well with the diversity of of bacteria so that one i like well, honestly things seem to do great in my quarantine i don't know why but they do that's that's pretty cool yeah it's like my, my stuff does great in the quarantine tank but then when i hit the uh, hit it with the dr g's at the end of it, it's like they get pissed yeah. off so uh reef keepers asking me have i used the potassium chloride for smooth skin aquas i use it for everything and uh, knock on wood, I have not lost anything by doing the weekly dips on the... Um, on the I have tried that, and I had... It was the Reef Primer version, which is basically the same stuff, right? And, uh, yeah, I thought it, it seemed a lot harsher than bear to me. I didn't actually kill something, but, like, when it had parasites, I knew were there. And just to do tests on it, it didn't always kill some of those gray bugs either, which worried me, so that that's why I kind of went back to the bear plus the bear is real real mild on stuff and intercept treatments are like corals don't even blink they like it if anything they want like beef flavor or whatever it is so <laughs> i'm gonna yeah, i'm gonna, gonna have to try that instead of the dr g's i don't know man dr g's the whole thing with the dr g's is like you got to keep it in a separate um bucket for like six hours you know so it's yeah that's right that in itself is kind of depending on the coral it could be yeah kind of so stressful. it's it's been stressful um so no alk dosing in the QT tank, Frank Aaron is asking. Yeah, I do not. Water change from the main. And the alk's kind of high in there already. So, um, 
yeah, they, uh, it's it, it's it, it's interesting that you um, you mentioned a uh, using a little protein uh, skimmer on the quarantine system because um, I basically have you know my nutrients almost like zeroed out in my quarantine tank. Yeah. And well, it's not pulling much out. It's basically an aerator. It's pulling the pH uh, up. Is my goal with that. Paul, great beer reef, man. Thank you so much for that super chat. Appreciate the streams and the wealth of knowledge from the weekly guest. Thank you, dude. And I appreciate you you moderating. <laughs> I really do. Um, so yeah, no, that's it's it's interesting, you know. I think uh, and and the whole um, the the bug issue is uh, is fascinating because I've heard about um, you know obviously everybody I think has heard about red bugs and there's been talk about black bugs. You mentioned gray bugs. I don't I'm not sure if I've ever heard of gray bugs before. I mean, there's a lot of bugs out there, right? Yeah, it's a copepod. It's similar to red bugs. Uh, again, yeah, these are all just hobby terms. There's no real hard uh, use of science around the hobby. But, um, yeah, it seems to be, it's like a dorsoventrally flattened one, whereas red bugs are kind of like a flattened vertically, look like a flea running around on your acro. These things are more like dome-shaped, hugged tightly against the coral. They're the color of, like, the mottled zooxanthellae on the bottom of the coral. Um, and they don't look like much at all. The best way to see them is at night on darker colored acro, especially like uh, uh, Oregon tort would get them, I'd notice. And the hoaxamai, the deep blue corals, for some reason, w- would have them. And uh, tenuous, I've seen them on. Now you... And, yeah, they just, they're, they lock on there. They're nearly as mobile as red bugs. Um, but if you shine them with a flashlight at night, sometimes you see a little glint that looks like a white speck. And it's actually a reflection off their eyes uh, or some structure near their eyes in the front end of them uh, that you kind of catch that glint and then you put them under a dissecting scope and you can see what's going on. They're carrying babies around, kind of like red bugs or, uh, or a crayfish or something or a lobster. They carry their babies on them. And so uh, there's no real egg stage from what I understand that you have to kill off. You just have to make sure that uh, you get them all in, in multiple rounds of so whatever the babies in that they're carrying survive they don't repopulate they do a couple rounds of it so how many times do you hit your quarantine tank you know when you bring in a, a set of frags with the uh, with the interceptor three times three times is what i go for you yeah. and that's over uh, uh every week you're hitting them with the interceptor mm-hmm. yeah yeah oh maybe i should i should tweak that uh routine of mine because uh I'm, yeah i'm doing the dr g's just that one treatment at, at the uh at the end but uh yeah you know it's um it's it's important you don't want to like uh you know get some unwanted pests into the uh into the system then you're just kind of like um you know um dealing with that and and uh it's uh it's, it can be problematic on many fronts Mm-hmm. Especially with, and if you're shipping stuff out, like you don't want to be ever shipping out a pest to anybody. So that makes me hyper paranoid. Just, you know, shipping a lot of frags out. I don't want to be that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Par- uh, Chris, ACI uh, Agriculture Parasitic Copepods? Question mark. Yeah, there are, there are such things, right? I do. I saw one on a. Uh, somebody posted a picture on Facebook. I think it was a branching samacora, maybe or. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And it had uh, a parasitic coat bod running around on it. It looked identical to those gray bugs, which chances are it's not the same species. But it's interesting to note that they could be even across genera like that. I mean, there's ones that would infect, I can't remember what people call them, brown bugs or something like that. It was like a red bug version on my Now there's brown that, bugs? <laughs> yeah, that was years ago. I mean, this was, I saw those in like, oh, yeah, 07, 08. I remember seeing those on Matapora. And freaking out um but yeah there's all kinds of parasites and the thing is like people hear about acroating flatworms and red bugs and then black bugs whatever if that's even one thing or multiple things uh but yeah there's other stuff out there that you always want to watch out. chances are it's like a sort of diverse subfamily of copepods that all um, radiated out specialized in different corals there's a lot of different trip wires in this hobby isn't there <laughs> there's so many ways for things to go wrong and yeah uh, and sometimes one will trip the next one it's a chain reaction yeah um got a question from colin uh gearing did your aquabiomics dna analysis show any pests uh i guess this question no. is that a question for you uh tim or is it because uh, i 
Could be. I mean, I wrote, I did run that. Uh, it's been a few years. I ran one of those aquabiomics, uh, basically environmental DNA or like composite of all the different microbes in your system. I didn't get any pests showing up in mine. No. Yeah. Neither did I. Um, what was I going to ask you? Yeah. So we were talking about, um, bacteria dosing and stuff. Is that something you do not do at this point? I've never done that. No. Yeah. It, Is that a, usually an effort to tweak your nutrients, right? Yeah. I think the, you know, the other reason people, um, you know, do it is, and this is another thing I've talked about a lot in videos and on the stream is, is that, um, you know, is the equipment that we're using today so much more efficient, like the skimmers these days and the uh, filtration equipment that, you know, is it pulling out the beneficial bacteria and do the beneficial bacteria need to be replaced? I don't know the answer to that. And I think, you know, I think we need more um, data on that. But... It's not pulling out what's like on your rock. I think starting right. with dry rock it's the main issue and the fact that I still have a system that was started off uh, live rock, I think it probably makes a big difference in terms of my success and resilience to all these things going wrong over the years. Yet I haven't, you know, knock on wood, had a total crash, but you know, it'll be tomorrow. That's on my luck. <laughs> you can't, can't even say the name of the thing. Nah, yeah, we don't, we don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and so like I have loads of sponges, like I don't know how many different types of sponges good. grow on my rock. I've actually thought about, and I started my my backup system a couple of years back with a few chunks of rock and then mostly dry rock um, in the sump to sort of get it started and all water from my main system to see. And it's ended up with a very different cycle. Like I dose nitri uh, nitrates into that just to give myself the option. Some, it seems like some corals really like nitrates and they color up differently and um, some thrive in one system and some don't in the other. Um, but yeah, a couple of people recently have been like, can you sell me some chunks of rock? And I think I have a bunch of that, uh, like that sea chem media, which is basically just chunks of like dry rock. Uh, I may load that up into my sumps and, and just offer that as a, you know, a little, uh, biodiversity boost, uh, for people. So I think that that could be a, a, a really major benefit to, to systems is adding something like that, that you just can't get off of. I mean, all you're adding is little frags, which you probably even break off the plug. So there's nothing going in there except the coral. Um, you can add bottled bacteria, but whether that's anything even close to what you need. Um, I don't think the skimmers pulling out are too clean for uh, a lot of the bacteria in your rock and stuff, because those are more of a benthic species that are attached to substrates yeah. rather than, uh, and that's kind of like what that aquabiomics gets at is you got to actually swab surfaces of pipes yeah. and things to get a, an accurate representation of what's going on in there. When, when you get so, uh, RTN or STN events, what um, what do you typically think is the cause of those? Or, you know, is that something that rarely happens to you? I mean, obviously it happened to you because of the assault yeah. issue, but, um, you know. Yeah, the assault issue, it's uh, occasionally there's corals that are just jerks. There's a couple like <laughs> Hung's rainbow explosion or whatever he calls it. That one's a jerk. That coral is not a consistent grower at all. I had a six inch colony and split it up and I can't, you know, some of them are growing still and they've just been turned brown for the past three years instead of rainbow explosions. Um, that's one of the most frustrating corals there is. And there's a few of those nemeses, the purple monsters one that, you know, you think you're doing great and then four years later dies. Um, or a pearlberry. That's or a pearlberry. That's one that I struggled with for years and years. I could not get to grow, and all of a sudden, it's doing phenomenally well for me. Dude, I gotta um, get a frag of that because I love. Yeah, I lo the original one is stunning. It is an amazing coral. I got it both systems. For whatever reason, the fates are smiling on me, and whether it's like a lot of it, I think has to do with the frag you start with. Um, in so many cases, I think things like the jaw dropper, which you were talking about earlier. That's a coral that's been in the hobby and kept its price up for ages and ages. And a lot of the things that were sold is people just cut them too early because they wanted to make their money back on them. So they, you know, frag frags. And some corals you can do that with. I think some of the tenuous can withstand that and they just grow into the branch. But others just die or they stall out or they're never going to be the same if you cut them too early. And so starting with a healthy piece of an actively growing, you know, a healthy colony makes a huge difference. And I'll have that where I had the same coral from two different sources and one just thrives forever. And the other one just constantly has issues with uh, Oregon torts one that I always had issues with like that. I got it from a new source and it's been 
you know, uh, resilient and stable for the past three, four years, whereas I struggled over and over with it from the different source. Yeah. Interesting. I, yeah. um, in my old system, when I used to live in Connecticut years ago, I grew the orary pearlberry like a weed and it was, it's a brilliant looking coral. I mean, it's, it's kind of like this almost, it, uh, it's not like a table, but it's just a very dense in terms of the formation of the branches, the pearlescent uh, coloration on the thing. Like luminous blue inside kind of. A, it's, yeah. it's so cool. But uh, yeah, I'm going to definitely have to uh, hit you up for that. Uh, Cause I, I've been, yeah. uh, I've been looking for like the genuine or a pearlberry, but yeah. uh, I keep kind of striking out when I think I get yeah. it. There's a lot of fake ones out there. And I, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of rumors. If you dig into those threads, people are like, oh, I know I had a guy who had what is the Thurman's Rainbow now, got a chunk of that off of me and sold it as ORA Pearlberry on forums for years. <laughs> oh, really? And so there's a lot of contamination of. I think I've got your. Uh, I think I got your right rainbow. Because of my oh. corals of that uh, lineage. So you're responsible and, uh, then for that, huh? Yeah. yeah. I didn't sell it. It was that by any <laughs> No name at that point. But yeah, he had a tendency to just label whatever he got from me as whatever he wanted it to be rather than what it, what it was. Um, Chris, yeah. I think you you have, uh, I think Chris at ACI has got a couple of or eight Pearlberry colonies. I believe that's what I saw in some footage that I shot a few weeks ago over at ACI that uh, right. I, I texted Chris uh, earlier today. I was like, dude, my, my, uh, I, I was like, I was going through all this footage I shot at uh, at ACI, and I was like, my jaw was like just freaking hit. I, I don't remember how like awesome the stuff was until I started looking at the footage. But I do think yep. I, I I did I, I do think I, I uh, was uh, I, I captured a couple of um, over eight pearl berries within that footage. Um, so you mentioned the uh, the jaw dropper. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Is that uh, that's pretty uh, well in demand? It it is. It takes a, uh, it's kind of like pulling off a Band-Aid to get involved in it because it's such an expensive coral. It's a coral that's held its price for, I don't even know when it came into the hobby. It's from Reef Raft Canada originally and went through a couple people. And a lot of people have had modest-sized mini colonies, basically. Um, and there's there's not many big colonies of it. And I, I lucked out and got a really healthy frag. It was one of those situations. And I never could justify buying it uh, for cash. Like, it was... Uh, just too expensive and reef raft pieces some of them don't actually live up to the hype and uh you know the the photos so i was very skeptical and then uh, my friend ty and i were doing some trading and he sent me a chunk and uh it was it lived up to the hype it grew out into an absolutely gorgeous colony one of the nicest acropora i've ever seen in my life for sure and uh and it's thriving for me and i cut it i've cut the mother colony twice now and uh kind of let it get big and big and didn't talk about it and didn't, didn't touch it didn't look at it. Um, didn't want to jinx it for years. And then for about almost two years. And then I finally cut a chunk off and started. Selling so what, um, what size would you say you grow frags out to before you start fragging three, four inches? It depends on the coral. That one, I knew what it, like after I started growing it, I realized what it was like, why people were doing so poorly with it. It's, it looks like it's a very similar species to, um, the BC set for stun, which I've had for since that first came into the through Adam. And, uh, I think the first trip I, I made to his house, he gave me like the last little bit of it. He's like, take care of this. This is cool. It's the last <laughs> and, a half. and, uh, I grew it out and yeah, it, it turned out into this. It's like these little dense little mini table kind of things, but it was really bright colors. And now there's a few other things floating around that are, uh, the refractions I am. And that, but after growing the set for stun for so long, I knew like I couldn't, you can't cut that one early. You cut it, the branch off and it doesn't grow back. It's like it, it doesn't just re sprout like a lot of corals do and kind of compensate for that loss. That's just all you get out of it. And so you have to wait until it's a good size if you want to start fragging it. And uh, a lot of things won't take repeated fragging too. So uh, yeah. I'm really, really leery of, you know, offering something for sale and then cutting it one week and then cutting another frag the next week and cutting the next week. I'll tend to just like do one more major cut. So it's one stress to the coil rather than repeated uh, cuts on it. Uh, so that's sort of my shifting philosophy on these things don't seem to thrive uh, under uh, repeated fragging. Some things are, a lot of corals are fine with it. I mean, so many corals have no issue with cutting a frag every couple of weeks. 
um, but some really do. Colin, uh, Colin uh, Gehring yeah. is saying, I put my jaw dropper from Tim through hell and it's still thriving, exclamation point. Thanks for the healthy frag. <laughs> it is, I'm shocked after all I've heard about that coral over years, how durable the frags have been. I, I think I lost, I had a couple of them go through two day shipping, three day shipping and live. Really? Um, two to three day I'm shipping back. and it lived? Whoa. I, yeah, I overbag them because I know what it is and, you know, I want to be careful, but yeah. It's, uh, Talk about your, um, uh, so um, what was my other question? Um, all right, we'll segue into my next uh, question, but um, in, in terms of the um, fragging and whatnot, do you find that certain, I guess it just depends, it sounds like to you that um, it just depends on the coral in terms of whether or not fragging coral will actually stimulate growth? It just definitely depends on the coral. Um, some it will, some it won't. Uh, some things, I mean, I'll have frags that sit there that I'm really uh, hopeful for. I think they're going to be cool. I really love smooth and stuff. That's kind of what I'm shifting my collection to. Kind of, I mean, there's so many people who are growing corals now. I try and, you know, you got to figure out what you're going to do in the future to keep your keep demand up and keep people interested in what you got if you got the same thing everybody else has. Um, you got to try to specialize. So I'm kind of leaning towards smooth skin stuff and that, uh, yeah, it doesn't always stimulate growth. You really have to grow that out. So I've been kind of hoarding those. If I see a new one or something interesting, I don't have, I tend to buy it up or uh, trade for it. What are your, uh, then, but yeah, to your process of getting it big enough to where I'd be comfortable with fragging some of those granules. So, um, I just don't trust it. it's going to do well after I cut them. So, Chris is wondering from ACI, does Tim have any acros that just grow differently in his system? We have a or a tort that has the strangest growth pattern. Yeah, I mean, getting back to that, like um, <clears throat> some corals from some sources do well and some don't. Uh, the mechanism behind that, I can't entirely explain uh, because, yeah, you think genetically they're the same. But, I mean, you can get sick thing, you can get sick organisms, so why not have a chronic sickness in an acropora that doesn't fare well in the long term? Um, you can get those, like, metaplasias where they get weird growth on them. Um, you see that now and then. I don't entirely understand that, whether it's contagious or whether it's uh, due to environmental factors or something that isn't contagious and will grow out of it. Um, I had a couple, one guy gave me a big colony of, like, it was a... Uh, one of the jokers, I think, one of the joker act before, it was just covered in those weird, like, you know what I'm talking about there, Keith? Like this weird kind of crusty growth, spiky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right at all. And uh, I ended up throwing out most of that and just took some of the best frags I could that looked the most normal and put those into quarantine and watched them for a while. And I was, yeah, it was a couple months before I found out, like, all right, they're growing normally. I'll put them in my system. I never saw it after that. So, um, it may have been environmental and that was just uh, uh, not a contagious issue, but I'd be paranoid it was a virus. And then suddenly all my acros are growing all weird and deformed and yeah, you don't want that. What, uh, what are you digging these days in terms of smooth skins? Uh, there's a few sneaking around. There's um, the Peng's blue monster. Um, that guy Peng, uh, he had a really nice collection. It's a shame he's not in the hobby anymore. And I wish I had found him earlier and we could have, uh, joined forces or something because he had a super cool collection. He was kind of hoarding all that smooth stuff and he did really well with a lot of difficult corals. Um, so I got a few from him that are really nice. That I like, um, the blue monsters one that's got kind of a white base with kind of a purplish blue tips, almost like an ice fire Australian echinata color scheme, yep. but on that big, uh, chunky smooth, um, uh, kind of Christmas tree growth branches. There's a reef gen blueberry fantasy, which is, very similar growth, but like a bright royal blue with a green base, which I really like. And then there's a whole suite of those, like granulosa, yeah, ripies. A lot of little variations, and a lot of them are renamed between different vendors, and you can get the same thing for you know ten percent or twenty percent of the price of what one vendor selling it for, <laughs> and same coral to something else. Um, but yeah, so I'm just kind of slowly accruing a lot of those here and there. Um, to just grow them out and see if they see what they turn out nice as. It's really hard to know with blue light 
photography now what is actually nice <laughs> i know i uh i find it very difficult to um i you know i kind of stick to the stuff that um you know is more old school i you know that that is definitely my preference because i know what it looks like and um so even if i you know, even if i see like a picture where there's like a lot of you know freaking blue light i was like all right i know what this coral should be so it doesn't really mm -hmm. bother me in terms of getting tricked right. yeah if it's been around a while but a lot of these things that are Certain vendors are notorious for, and some of their prices are very high. And it's like, wow, that's gorgeous. I really want an orange granulosa with blue tips. So if anybody's out there, I've got a photograph of one in the wild under sunlight, so I know they exist. And uh, it was one that was, uh, I think, Rocky Mountain Frags, Jared had one called the Oracle that was that. And I really wanted it, and it was gone. He lost it all. Everybody, mm -hmm. I found one guy, AV99, uh, Aqua Vista a friend of mine he had like the last piece i knew of and he finally lost it which is kind of Bummer. sprawled out I, so i haven't seen so i've been trying to like buy up ones that look like that in pictures and so far every single one of them doesn't have blue tips it's not real blue it's all just blue light on an orangish and there's a lot of those kind of orangish ones that are probably the same coral just resold over and over it's the same thing. what about the whole uh, but, rainbow tenuous craze I kind of leave that to other people. I've got a few <laughs> tenuous to do well. And I don't know. I, there's so much hype and things that don't end up looking as good as the photos. And I don't want to sell something to somebody that really is a disappointment. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will say that like the jaw dropper thing is like, I know it's a rare coral and it looks stunning in my tank and I don't want to feel like I'm taking advantage of people. But I feel like it's, a gorgeous coral that is truly spectacular and worth it's even less than some of those tenuous sell for obviously. Um, but I know they're not going to feel like we get ripped off. And so far all the feedback has been, Oh my God, this is the best looking frag I've ever seen of this coral. I've never, I didn't know it could look like this. So that makes me sort of happy that I'm, I'm not giving people a sense that I'm ripping them off. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> so, that, that feedback I is doing that rainbow tenuous game. Again, there's so many of those that are like, coral i know i have that i grew it next to it and it cost 10 percent of that and i bought it five years ago and it's just they're all a lot of mariculture pieces just coming in multiple times from the same growers uh in indonesia so yeah. i'm with you man i'm the same way i like that's not my bag i um i just i i i, I tried to like you know there's there's a couple of rainbow tenuous out there that I, I truly think are uh, pretty spectacular. I think the home wrecker is pretty awesome. The Walt Disney. Yeah. yeah. I like I had that one a long time ago. I'm happy I finally got a piece sort of the back of that one. Um, doing well again. That's a touchy coral. Not as bad as the Hung's Rainbow, but it is one that uh, it's frustrating. Um, the uh, Jackson's Rainbow Tenuous, that piece that I uh, I sent you, man. Yeah, That's a that, cool piece. That one, unfortunately, I got from you right before this water change issue. And the piece I'd gotten from you the first time was one of the perhaps the best looking tenuous in my nitrate dose system I'd ever seen. It was like hot pink with orange polyps around it and vivid indigo blue and green. I was like, I got to get more of this from, from Keith. And then that, that issue sort of through that system, especially through, uh, through some struggling times. And uh, yeah, they're still doing well. They're encrusting, but they're they're enough to peak glory like that. Well, that first frag was. Yeah, you know, once once it gets happy again, man, it's like you know, I I run like pretty much full spectrum, you know, type of lighting. I've got I've got that piece both in my um, my halide system as well as my uh, LED system. And actually, I think it's coloring. It's got better color in the LED system because I've got more yeah. par in that system. Probably got like it's probably getting like three hundred to three fifty par in the LED system versus maybe. Uh, 200 to 250 under the uh and the, under the halides and i'm getting yeah. um you know it, the whole trick with that coral is to bring out the reds and the pinks yeah those pinks and the, like the polyps seriously were like bright orange almost like you kind of had to look at it because it was still a pretty small piece but it's like wow there are colors in there i did not i've never seen on any of these right in in, in that, full spectrum it, the color is nothing like the most of this new stuff under white light is just like well that's kind of grayish pinkish greenish over and over and over until yeah without a filter in blue light um and there's like um, the cc pink highlighter one is that's another coral that's like really nice like standalone next to other corals you don't have to be a, a tenuous connoisseur to see that's a great looking coral and 
that's the kind of the ones I gravitate towards and keep consistently. Tyree Superman has a nice deep blue. Uh, dude, um, I got a, I got a frag from you and Tyree Superman tenuous. That thing is kick ass. I love that coral. That's a great looking coral. I've had red polyps in it. I have not had them reliably, but I, it is possible. Just it's so but, blue, uh, you know. And again, it's 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 yeah. um it's it's it stands out. So uh, Chris is uh, wondering, I did uh, I did see this. Did you guys see the Acro Vincent and Bally uh, Ac- uh, Mariculture just posted? Yeah, that looks like. And so there's a piece at Aqua Vista that Tim Felsberg had years ago called the AV99 Voodoo. It was before the CC Voodoo yes. Magic and all that. And it was that species, but it was just, a, it was a blue and green one. But I love that coral, and I grew it for years, and I think it's finally just disappeared. But it grows, it looks kind of like a tenuous, but has bright fluorescent yellow in every coralite, like the, uh, like some of the echinatas have. Like, I really like those corals that do that, but there aren't many of them that grow well. Um, but yeah, I had that one for years, and I loved it. And the only other one I've seen like that was the Vivid Insanity, and I haven't started growing that one yet. The price is still kind of high, and... I know how touchy that species is, so I'm a little leery. But yeah, that one looks worth. I hope I hope that gets spread around. Yeah, that would be like, awesome. That is like a kick-ass looking piece. Put that good under white light. I'd uh, I'd be really happy to try that. Uh, John Graves is uh, wondering, asking you, does Tim have the BC bonsai humulus? I do have loads of that. It's like this big. Are <laughs> 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 the fastest growing of those stubby, relatively shallow water type acros. I have. What, um, what would you say are like your top three most underrated corals? <sighs> most underrated corals. You know, that you love that people just don't seem to gravitate. I to. People don't see the, I think Fox flame is one of the all time best looking corals. Like it's hold in a colony. It looks spectacular. And the prices are kind of dwindled on that. And that's not even like, hot coral anymore but whether there's solid deep red coral with yellow tips that keeps that color yeah uh you know is out there there's nothing um so i always love that one that one can be touchy at times too but uh i really like that coral um some of the the cc bahama mama i finally got a decent piece of that growing lately and that's really really nice all time one of the best millipora i'm not a big milli guy they're frustrating because i think they're kind of like those some of the smooth skins that you really have to not touch them until they get big. And my, I, they tend to stall out and then just dwindle away if you cut them repeatedly. Um, at least for me anyway, like back in my, that's one of the things under halides. I felt like I could cut those things all the time. I mean, it's 20 year old memories now, so it <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Could have been a victim to the, yeah, the brain cells lost the time, but uh, yeah, I feel like they were way more resilient back then and now. Seems like if I frag Millie's a bunch, I just have issues with them. Yeah, Millie's are. Uh, right. I, I I love Millie's. Millie's are like probably my favorite in terms of uh, Acropora. But um, you know, if um, if things like are not optimal, or if you get some pretty uh, good swings in terms of alkalinity, or or something else is going on, it seems like they get pissed off before uh, a lot of other corals. And it, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you could like have a this Millie colony just going like gangbusters, and all of a sudden like. like starts like showing signs of like you know deteriorating and it's a bummer but um millers are so freaking cool that's like and that's kind of why i'm getting it like the smooth skins there's so many luckily they're still persisting in the hobby but how many big colonies do you see those things like hardly anybody has them and i think it's because you get fragged too early and you know that sets them back and they're toast um but yeah so that's one thing that i'm really just kind of i i hope to build a build demand for and build a following over the years if i can bring this plan to fruition you know what uh, just kind of like some of those you know i mean some of my favorite smooth skins are the uh, the tyree red dragon the Ray hawkins they're just like really yeah, the old things yeah it's a great one i got this purple taraki that's it's a more of a branchy one more like Ooler's taraki and that's one that it's stunning it's like purple monster colors but a smooth bottle brush. is that um uh, was that from adam at better corals was that or is that a different no, like, it, is that the the it was the, i think it's the same as the Tarot. Tarot, yeah that's the, it uh, rod bueller back in the day i was in his basement 20 some years ago back before he was he was famous yeah with uh <laughs> carlos we went to visit him. but um uh yeah i think it might be the exact same one it was from uh reef nation there's a guy in that area too uh who has who i got it from and it's 
a really unique piece. It's uh, like nothing I've seen any anywhere else for a long time. What uh, what corals do you regret having in your systems? Grow too fast or uh, too sensitive or, you know, you just like, you know what? I'm done with that kind of coral. Yeah. There's some encrusting monies that are getting that way. I've got that old, it's like the half cube display tank and there's some of those. I was like, I'll just cover all the surfaces with encrusting monies and so fast meteor shower literally covering two sides of that tank and I can't get it off. Like I've tried putty knives and hammers and like risking calamities trying to get this stuff <laughs> off. That's on there. It's just like a permanently opaque side of the tank. That's why you don't see a whole lot of, uh, of great videos of some of these tanks, uh, maybe on the thread from years past that you know they're not in their prime at the moment. It's always a it's always a flux and cycle. I've got um, yeah. in my 187 gallon display tank, which I'm actually going to be doing a complete reboot on it in terms of the rock. I um, probably like 95 percent of the corals that are facing the light, 95 percent of the rock that's facing the light is covered by coral um a lot of encrusting montes i've got this uh Ore red planet that just i don't know for some reason it's just decided to like take on the characteristics of an encrusting montipora because like I've, I've i've had it for years and it's like seriously covered like about a 10 inch 10 inch space of the rock and it's got yeah. you know maybe like uh, like three branches that have come out in the middle of it. it's like what what the hell you know so, yeah, like, so I like, um, you know, my philosophy is like, all right, I've, it's a beautiful tank. It's, it's totally mature. I've got, um, Cali tort that's like gone bananas. My Oregon blue tort in there has gone bananas. I've got a tub still out of Montepora that has taken over like a third of the tank. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, you know, like you, I sell corals and all that stuff. I need some, I need some of that real estate back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have done some brutal things to encrusting monies in a few of my systems. Like uh, some of my friends will text the pictures and be like, I just took out two square feet of monoporins on the floor and I'm throwing it in the trash. <laughs> this is just not something you keep doing. You pull all the, once you get the rocks loose because they're cemented to the tank, you bust them loose and then you just chisel away until you can find the rock underneath and start over. And I have a, yeah, there's a couple tanks like that. I really need to do that too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to, like, I'm going to be doing a thing like, in the future, I'm going to have like some free time and then I'll <laughs> never show up. Or, oh, I'll have a week where I just did, yeah, I'm just going to do stuff. And, yeah, just kicks the can down the road for years. So, um, all right, dude, I, I think we're going to, we're kind of getting near the end here. I don't want to like keep you too much longer. Um, let me ask one last question of you. What would be your top three pieces of advice for folks that want to try to take it to the next level with SPS? Take it to the next level. I mean, it's such a, uh, it's an opinion-based thing. I will say I love calcium reactors. Um, once you get the right setup, it, it's so much more reliable. I think a lot of tanks have failed due to dosing, um, overdosing, underdosing, dosing pump failures, whatever, uh, dumping dosed too far into tanks. So um, I will say that after, yeah, since 2006, just running calcium reactors, I have not done that. Um, and it's, a, I think, a safer and uh, perhaps better way to do things. Um, but you have to have a big enough system to kind of justify it. Uh, I do like reef sprayers, LEDs. There's so many different ways for that to be done. And I will say, trying to get biodiversity into your tank to make it more resilient, I feel like, is uh, diversity in what's grown on your rock is probably pretty important. Um, and I don't know if there's, aside from like people like me growing out rock and starting to sort of spread it around uh, or seeing if you can find some live rock to feed your tank. Uh, that's a, that, I think that's, probably, that's a piece of advice I give a lot of people that are starting to dry rock only yeah. tank is like, try to find some live rock to put it in your sump to help seed the thing. Yeah. And it, even if it's just goes in your sump and it's like, cause you can get some pesky stuff on live rock. Yeah. Most of the pesky stuff is photosynthetic. So if you put it in the darkness, you'll be able to get the benefits of the sponges and whatever else filtering your water the bacteria without uh, as much risk of introducing an algae you don't want or, uh, you know, aptasia usually don't tear, you know, take off in total darkness for you. So. Yeah. One thing that I'm going to be doing with the, um, with my reboot in the system is um, I'm going to be putting a cryptic sump online. So what, I, what mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be pulling all the, uh, I've got Haitian lab rock that, you know, the stuff that's covered with corals and stuff. I'm going to have to just basically pull all that out uh, gradually, not all at once. 
chisel the crap out of it, you know, and make sure I don't uh, put any dead uh, coral in the, uh, in the crypt. But then basically take that rock and put it in the cryptic sump and put um, mm -hmm. dry rock that I've been cooking for a few months in a Rubbermaid stock tank that um, I basically have been seeding with established tank water and be doing like 10% water change yeah. on a weekly basis and also dosing in some bacteria. So um, yeah, kind of doing that swap out, but that's, that's interesting that you uh, say that, you know, I think um, cryptic sum could certainly be a, um, an another way to go with a dry rock tank that, um, you know, if you uh, want to start it with complete uh, dry rock, but maybe have like, you know, if you can fit, live rock in, into your sump that's great but i guess a cryptic sump or or some other type of uh, add-on to the sump with live rock in it i don't think it could mm -hmm. hurt anything no and uh i lost my train of thought there um but yeah i think uh getting that i think sponges like really do make a big difference i mean they're the organisms that filter it's not just like passive water flowing over they're pumping all the water yeah. in your system cells and pulling stuff out um, and they're going to pull your uh, silicates down. They're building with building with skeletons with silica. Um, what I was going to say is dry rock too. Like I started, I've added on several tanks over the years, and I've noticed like even if you cycle dry rock, as soon as you add it to a system, there is a massive multi, maybe even multi-year cycle to getting that algae sort of stabilized where you're not growing mostly fermented snails. You're not growing mostly bubble algae. You're not growing mostly obnoxious brown coral in that like overtakes corals. Like there's so many things that can go wrong with dry rock yeah. uh, from scratch, even in the system that you think, Oh, it's just going to colonize with coral algae. Like, no, it doesn't. There's a lot. So you always have to load it up with um, hermits and things like that to get it, uh, keep it in check. Yeah. Loads of snail turbos and stuff sort of manage that as soon as it hits light it's going to do different things yep all right dude well listen tim man this has been a great uh conversation and i uh, i appreciate you coming on and love to have you on again uh down the road sure yeah hopefully it was uh useful to people and they heard something that was interesting to them i'm not sure if it was all that entertaining it was mostly uh <laughs> more for shots well you know i i think uh you know coral talk to me is like uh i'm you know obviously we're a very uh defined niche audience right here in terms of uh what we uh geek, at, yeah. geek out on so yeah next time we'll just talk about hrvs we'll be yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> nuances of uh, getting rid of your dehumidifiers there you go so well, all right, man. Tim, thank you so much for, for being on the live yep. stream. And I also want to thank. thank yeah, yep. yeah. No, it was awesome again. Uh, I also want to thank Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for, for sponsoring the show. And also want to thank all you folks out there for tuning in and for contributing to the uh, the chat. And reminder that all episodes of Wrapping with Reef Bum are also available now as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. My next live stream will be next Thursday, April seventh is that right i think so at 7 p.m eastern yep. standard time and i'm gonna have uh, abe from coral euphoria on again so uh that was a great show the last time should be another great one uh coming up next week so please uh tune in until then be safe and we will see you next time